Thanks, Jillian. So first I'd like to say thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and I wanted to give you just a small introduction to, to me and my background. Um, I've been with Blackboard for just going on 10 years now and for all of that time I've worked in product design and user experience and accessibility has been a fairly significant component of my work related to that. Uh, and then one year ago, just just over one year ago, Blackboard created a full-time program around accessibility, and I stepped into the leadership position of that at that time, um, and it expanded my product ownership beyond just our learning management system to all of the products that we build and deliver, and making sure that we are doing all of the right things regarding accessibility for that. So. I'm very excited to be in the role. It's something I'm incredibly passionate about and uh, definitely to be here sharing this information with all of you today. Um, it does sound like there's somebody's microphone on in the background um, just to ensure the audio for everyone else. If you wouldn't mind muting your microphone if you're not speaking, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. So I wanted to start off by talking about Blackboard's commitment to accessibility. So as an organization, we are fully committed to delivering product experiences that pay attention to the global accessibility standards. And for us, that means looking primarily at the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, version 2.0. These are the internationally recognized guidelines in almost every country around the world when you start digging into what their technology standards are. And they're the standards that the British Standards Institute also notes in their technology standards, and it's a critical part of, of what we do. Um, here in the U.S., we have a separate set of standards called Section 508, um, and while we do still pay attention to them, our primary target has shifted away from the North American standards into these internationally recognized standards. But just focusing on standards isn't really enough. In order to build a mature digital accessibility program where we can deliver solutions that really meet the needs of, of all of your institutions, we need to partner with people both in our client base and outside of our client base. Right now in the UK, we have initiated a partnership with the University of York with Helen Petrie and others on her team to do some user testing with folks with disabilities in their testing lab at the University of York. We do similar things in the North American market as well. But I thought it was very uh, valuable for you guys to know that there's some good things happening in, in the UK as well to ensure that we, we understand the, the unique needs of, of the students in your market. We also look to organizations within the different markets that pay attention to disability services and try to create partnerships with them, like GISC in the UK and the British Computer Association for the Blind, looking to initiate conversations with those over the next 12 to 18 months and build programs and partnerships around that and how we can work together to provide good services to educational institutions around the world. And for us, it starts uh, with, with thinking about how to shift our, our mindset away from the individual disabilities to thinking about everything more inclusively. And Blackboard has developed a strategy and a framework for doing so that hopefully we can, we can present to you in a manner that helps you go and make some small changes to your face-to-face -face and online courses right after the, the webinar ends. And it starts for me with defining what we mean by inclusivity. And that really means providing all students, including those with significant dis disabilities, equitable opportunities to receive educational services. This may include the need for supplementary aid and support services, but ideally it's about focusing on helping these students to prepare for productive lives as full members of society. We did some research over the last two years with students in various markets who have various types of disabilities, and this was one of the primary insights that we gained, that their ultimate goal is to figure out how to live independently. And for many, many years, they've been very challenged to do so because they're segregated from many experiences in their digital lives. And this brings us to a com comparison and a contrasting of what we mean when we talk about integration versus inclusivity. So in both an inclusive and an integrated classroom, Students with diverse needs are included in general education methods. They're in the same classrooms. They're in the same digital spaces. But in an integrated classroom, it's really about requiring everyone to complete the same work. It's about creating one set of materials and one set of content and pushing everyone through the same methodology. 
But in an inclusive classroom, the focus shifts away from the work objects themselves more to the learning outcomes that are being achieved. And instead of requiring the completion of exactly the same work, you require the completion of exactly the same learning objectives. How you get there is, is a little bit irrelevant in some cases when you start thinking about inclusivity. And the same is true for assessment. In an integrated classroom, you use the same assessment materials to understand how well your students are, are learning the information that you're trying to convey. But in an inclusive classroom, you may need to take a step back and look at the way that each student needs to communicate their knowledge and their learning and differentiate your assessment expectations just a little bit to allow for that individuality. One interesting example that I saw of this this morning was a quote from um, a, a, an inclusive thinking blog that I follow that said, six plus three equals nine, but so does five plus four. And so when you respect those different methods of thinking, you ultimately get the same results. And I thought that was just a really interesting way to think about this, that those two students who put forward six plus nine and five plus four all got to the same result of nine, but they did it very differently. There are three primary components of an inclusive classroom, and they work together in order to help both teachers and students be successful. The first is truly understanding diversity and looking at the unique needs of the people in your classroom. Whether they have disabilities or not, it's about embracing that diversity and being aware of it in your classroom, even when it's not incredibly obvious. And then you move to equity, which is about providing equivalent access and equivalent opportunities to every diverse student in your classroom. But inclusion is actually about active engagement with that diversity in order to guarantee that feeling of equity in your classroom. And you need all three parts of this awareness in order to build a really, truly effective, inclusive classroom. There are many benefits to this when you look at it from the perspective of a student. One is engagement in the classroom. Often students with disabilities feel very, very isolated from their peers and they don't know how to engage with them, and they're not involved in the discussions in the classroom because the way they may communicate is very, very different. Inclusive classrooms also increase the level of socialization that's happening amongst the students in the room. When they're given an opportunity to work more closely together, it creates a much more positive environment, which leads to significant increases in success, especially for students with disabilities. I met a young man last year who um, is a law student at the University of, um, at UC Berkeley in California, University of California, Berkeley. And he's a law student, but he has cerebral palsy, and he also has something called valence syndrome, and he's had all of these things since he was very, very young. And physically, he tired out relatively quickly, so he's not able to take his own notes, and he's not able to um, interact with his computer using a mouse. And there's lots of physical and neurological challenges that come along with those two disorders. But he's honestly one of the smartest young men I've met in a really long time. When he was in the fifth grade, he had a teacher who refused to give him accommodations because he was too successful. He was too smart. That there was no way he could possibly be disabled and require the assistance of someone to take notes in the classroom. And it's these kinds of isolating moments that create a lot of challenges for students with disabilities in their perception of their own ability to succeed. And when you think more inclusively about this and you remove those barriers, you start to educate everyone else in your classroom about how people with various diverse needs interact with others in the classroom, it definitely creates much better environments for students. But without a doubt, it does come with some challenges for teaching. It's not always easy. Many times teachers are unaware of there being a student in their classroom that has a disability. And if they do, they may not know what to do about it. Unfortunately, there is still a significant knowledge and skills gap in our education system to help others understand the nuances of what it's like to learn or teach or interact in a digital environment when you have some form of physical or cognitive disability. There is also a perception of an increased amount of time involved in building an inclusive classroom. 
that you need to go back and change all of your old materials and make sure that everything is up to the right level of standards. And while you do need to do that, there are some ways that you can save some time when you're really thinking about it as an inclusive practice rather than multiple pieces of content. There's also a challenge with the technology and tools that you want to use in your classroom. All of us as educators strive to create the most engaging and, and, and uh, useful experiences in our classrooms, and we look to the technology that's available to us to do that. Some technology can be unbelievably empowering for someone who has a disability, and others can create significant barriers to their ability to succeed in your classroom. And while it's never a problem to use and get new and fascinating and engaging technology in your classroom, you really do need to think about what the impact is on someone who maybe can't see your screen or can't use a mouse. Does the experience of that technology prevent them from the learning that you are trying to convey? And the last challenge that we see existing in the creation of inclusive classrooms is the ongoing support that exists at the institutions. Some institutions have strong instructional design support and strong disability services support that can assist teachers who are thinking about changing their direction to be more inclusive. But many do not. And the teachers that are doing, that are moving in this direction are very concerned often that they're not going to have the support that they need in order to meet the objectives of inclusivity. And so what Blackboard has done is develop a, a strategy to help shift us towards this idea of inclusive thinking, where it's not just about thinking about the specifics of a disability, where it's not just about needing to understand how people with vision challenges or cognitive impairments learn, that it is about looking hard at our own practices, at our pedagogy, at the content that we're building or selecting to use in our classrooms, and at the technology that our institutions or ourselves are going out and sourcing to use, especially in our fully online classrooms, and really looking at what we can be doing to make different choices or make better choices when we're doing these things. And so that's what I want to share with you today. But it begins with understanding a little bit more about the diverse needs of the people in your classroom and how that may impact their learning. And I'd like to start with understanding cognitive challenges. This is the largest population of people with disabilities in the world. 25% of students with disabilities have a cognitive challenge. That's an incredibly high number when you compare it to some of the other disability categorizations. And cognitive challenges are often the ones that you are not aware of. They can range from things like dyslexia and ADHD, which are very hard to see when you are just looking at a group of students in your classroom. They're what we call invisible disabilities. But cognitive challenges also include things like autism and Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities. And there are some common impacts across all of these types of cognitive challenges on learning. Many of these students have difficulty receiving and processing information. They often have poor problem solving skills and need a little bit more time to work out what's being asked of them. They may be easily distracted and have trouble with memory and reading and writing even with reasoning and understanding. And in physical classrooms, they almost always have challenges understanding what the acceptable social behaviors are in the room. Many also have trouble concentrating and relying on, and rely on assistive tools for reading and comprehension assistance. And providing them access to information in multiple methods and giving them opportunities to behave and react and consume content in the way that's most comfortable to them is what's going to help them be successful. People with visual, visual challenges are probably the most well-known group of disabled students in the world today. It's very obvious when you have someone who has low vision or full blindness. It's not as obvious when you have someone in your classroom who has color blindness. And there's a significantly higher population of folks with low vision or color blindness than with complete blindness. And so thinking about the entire spectrum of visual challenges when you're, you're looking at your content, especially your digital content, is the key to creating inclusive experiences. Many folks with low vision rely on assistive devices to help them participate in classroom activities. This may be something as complex as screen reading technology but it may also be something as simple as a magnifying glass 
or the ability to look at the content on their own screen rather than being in a no laptops environment where or no devices environment where they have to rely on being able to see small text presented at the front of the room. Many also struggle to see color or read the content out loud in front of their peers. And if you're in a physical space, often folks with low vision or blindness have significant challenges moving around the physical space and need to be given time to orient to the room and need to be made aware of any physical changes in the classroom. Physical challenges is also another fairly visible and well-known set of, of disability challenges. And they can range from full loss of mobility, full paralysis, or just diminished muscle control. Many folks with physical challenges don't have control over their gross or fine muscles required to use technology, and they rely on alternative input devices in order to interact with their digital content. This can range from anything from a keyboard to something called a foot pedal or a mouse stick or even voice-activated software where they can tell their computer what to do. Again, in a physical classroom, many have difficulty moving about the space and making sure that they have pathways that their wheelchair can fit through or that they can navigate around with their crutches. And some may also struggle to communicate effectively with their teachers and students and classmates, given that they have challenges with their vocal cords and their ability to make sounds that others can easily understand. And the last section is really focused on hearing challenges. And again, similar to vision challenges, there's an incredible spectrum of hearing challenges that can exist. It can include slight hearing loss, ringing in their ears, profound hearing loss, or total deafness. And many may rely on assistive devices to help them participate in the classroom, hearing aids or cochlear imp implants. Some may be completely deaf and rely on sign language or text-based alternatives to the audio content that you're providing. And for many, especially those who have been deaf since birth, English is not their first language. British Sign Language or American Sign Language is their first language. And the structure of that language is incredibly different than the structures of English. And they've learned English in order to participate in standard classrooms and mainstream classrooms, but it is a second language, and this causes them to struggle with grammar, spelling, vocabulary, and oral presentations in your classroom. For the same reasons, many also have difficulty taking notes or listening to lectures and watching videos, and a big part of that is because their ability to consume information is highly visual, and when they have to look away from the speaker or look away from the video in order to take notes, they're likely to miss information. So what does all of this mean, and how can we apply it to the way that we think about things? Really, there is no perfect answer. There is no one-size-fits-all answer to inclusiveness. But the key is that it doesn't mean pushing all of your students to do the same thing in the same way. It really is about making sure that you're enabling everyone in your classroom to achieve the same goals that you've set out. And the first way to do that is to really take a look at your pedagogy potentially to rethink how learning is being achieved by the students in your classroom and by providing means to help these students succeed. And we've developed a checklist that can help you look at the, the specific things in your classroom that can assist with this. The first, and probably the most commonly done, is to make sure that you have a syllabus provided in your course, that that syllabus contains all of the information relevant to the course and to the assessment of the material and that it's available in a prominent place in the, in the curriculum in a digital environment, that all students know where to find it, and that the document itself has been made accessible. Oftentimes, goals and learning outcomes are clearly defined in the syllabus, but it's even more valuable to the students when those goals and objectives have been connected to the content, especially to the assessment that is being provided inside of digital experiences. It helps them remember what they need to be focused on and what they need to be conveying when they are submitting a paper or completing a test. What, what are they being assessed on? Providing opportunities for differentiation in the activities when that's applicable is also a huge component of inclusiveness. And I have one example that I wanted to share with all of you about that. 
I met a teacher from the University of Cincinnati here in the United States last fall, and she told me a story about a class that she's been teaching for a number of years. It's a writing class. It's an introduction to writing class for a first-year student. And she had an assignment that she gave in the first couple of weeks of class for every round of, of semesters that she's taught this session for. And the assignment was for the students to go home and find a photograph that was very meaningful to them, to write a story that described why that photograph was meaning to them, meaningful to them, how it impacted their life, and to bring both the photograph and their story to the next class and show the classroom the photograph and read the story aloud. And last spring, she had a student in her classroom who was blind. She gave the same assignment the exact same way she always did with the exact same instruction. And a week later, the student came to class and she had a photograph and she stood up in front of the class and she showed her photograph. But the photograph was backwards and it was facing the student, not the classroom, so no one else could see what it was. And she read the story about this photograph where she described the photograph incredibly well but could not convey anything that was emotional about the meaning or the connection that she had to the photograph. And in that moment, the teacher realized that there was no way that the student actually understood or could actively or successfully complete the assignment, which was all about showing emotion in prose and writing a story that pr presented their inner thoughts and their inner feelings and their inner thinking, because she could never have seen that photograph. So after the class was over, the teacher approached that student and asked her how she managed to complete the assignment. And the student said, well, you said I needed a photograph, so I asked my grandmother to just pick any photograph and to tell me what was in it and what it was, and I wrote about that. For the next semester that the teacher taught that class, she changed the assignment just slightly to ask the students to go find anything that meant something to them, a song, a book, a movie, an object, a photograph, anything that they liked, and write the story that conveyed the meaning. That semester, she got a significantly different set of stories from all of the students in her classroom, and all of them were of a higher quality when it came to understanding the meaning that they had attached to this object. That small differentiation made a huge difference towards helping the students in her class feel fully included and to be able to convey their understanding of the objective in a way that best met their own needs. But it's not just about differentiation in your activities. It's also about providing opportunities for collaborative learning. Students work better and learn better when they have an opportunity to work together. And this is especially true for students with disabilities who feel isolated in almost every scenario that they're put into in a classroom because their peers don't understand how to interact with them and how to communicate with them. And by putting a deaf student or a student with cerebral palsy into a group with their able-bodied peers, you're not only helping the student with disabilities learn how to communicate with others, but you're helping the rest of your class internalize what it is like to work with someone who has a disability or a different challenge and to understand that they truly are not incapable of achieving the same thing. They just do it differently. It's also important to make sure that explicit instruction is provided because folks with cognitive challenges, and especially students with autism, take things incredibly literally. And if there's an, any ambiguity to your instructions, those students are not going to successfully complete that assignment. And as always, universal thinking and universal design for learning is a critical component of any educational experience today. And so we really want to continue to make sure that we're paying attention to all of those universally designed elements of your course. But it's not just about your pedagogy. You also need to start rethinking and revisiting any content that you're create, creating and making sure that it's set up for universal consumption. But it's not just about the content that you create yourself. It's also about the content that you may be getting from publishers or that you're sourcing from things like YouTube or other digital sources. If the content doesn't meet the needs, you have the opportunity to choose not to use it. And by you as educators making the decision not to use content that's been set up for universal consumption, especially content coming from publishers, you can drive change in the publishing industry to make sure that they're considering inclusivity in all of the content that they provide as well. And so what does that mean? 
a very quick checklist for understanding the things about your content that have the biggest impact. It's first that any images that you're using have alternative text, that, that the information in that image can be conveyed in a different format. What you need in terms of an alternative text or a text format of the image depends on the complexity of the image. If it's a really simple image, you can just say what the image is. But if it's a complex diagram or an infographic of some kind, you need to make sure that all of that information and all of the knowledge conveyed in that diagram or infographic is provided in a text-based format. As much as possible, you should avoid images of text or blinking images and animations, as those have a tendency to cause, especially animations and blinking images, cause epileptic seizures in folks who have severe epilepsy in their classroom. If the animation is not critical to conveying the information, it's a good thing to ask yourself, is it really worth it? Do I really need to do that? Does it really add a lot of additional engagement to my content? Starting off when you're creating Word and PowerPoint documents by using the structures that Microsoft Office has embedded into its word processors actually saves you time in the end, but it also provides create a, a document structure that a non-visual user can consume using their screen reading technology. Screen readers are not capable of differentiating between text size and bolding or italics. So if you simply change the color of text or make it bigger or bolder or underline it in order to convey that that's a new section of content or it's a heading within your document, a non-visual user is not going to know that and they're going to just consume a large piece of text on a single page. But by using the heading structures that exist in Microsoft Word, you can create similar structures for the, for the non-visual users as well. And you can edit those heading formats to have them look any way that you like. And by using the structures available to you in Word, it actually saves you time in the long run if you ever wanted to make changes. If you don't use headings in, let's say, a 30-page document, and you need to change the style or you want to change the font or the size, you need to manually go through and change every heading within the 30-page document. But if you've used the embedded structures, you can go to one place and modify what heading two looks like in your document, and it will automatically update all of them. We see a lot of use of PDFs in digital content as well because it prevents students and, and others from editing our content. But PDFs are one of the most challenging things for screen reader users to interact with. You need to make sure that PDFs are tagged for accessibility. When you simply print to PDF from your computer or you go to a photocopying machine and scan a document and turn it into a PDF, those are not tagged for accessibility. They look like one big image to a screen reader and a non-visual user can't read any of the text within it. So it's important to make sure that we're tagging these PDFs and while that can be a very complicated process if you're doing the entire thing manually, tools like Microsoft Word and PowerPoint provide options to export documents to PDF that include the majority of the tags necessary to ensure that screen reader users can consume it. Microsoft Office on Windows also has built-in accessibility checkers that you can run to check the accessibility of your document. You also want to make sure that you're captioning any videos or that videos that you're choosing to use from outside sources already include captions. And captions can be a complicated thing to do, but there are tools that can make it easier. Um, many that learn your voice and learn your, your cadence and the, any accents that you may have and increase the quality of the captions over time so that it becomes less and less cumbersome to caption any videos that you are creating yourself. You can upload videos to YouTube and have it automatically generate captions, although I will say those captions only end up being about 50% accurate and you still need to go in and edit them and modify them, but it's a good place to start. Similar to what we talked about with your pedagogical assessment, you need to look at the instructions that you're providing and make sure that they are clear and succinct. Look at the color choices that you're making and make sure that the text can be differentiated from the background that you're not using light colored text on light backgrounds that are very hard to read, especially for someone who is dyslexic or has low vision or color blindness of some kind. And you want to avoid using tables for layouts, especially when you're building digital content online and presenting it in an HTML format. 
screen readers interact with tables very differently than they do with regular content on the page. And there are many options for creating layouts, moving images to the right or the left of your text that don't involve using tables. And many of these things you can actually do directly inside of the Blackboard Learn Editor. And the last bit is really about thinking inclusively about the technology that you're choosing to use in your classroom. Understanding how people with different needs interact with technology is really important to helping you make the necessary adjustments or accommodations to the, cho to the tools that you're choosing to use. And a couple of quick things to check there. Again, do the colors within the application have proper contrast? Can you magnify the entire page, or just, does just the text magnify and unfortunately overlay some of the buttons or links that exist on the page because they're not magnified as well? Can you get to everything using just your keyboard? If you're using an online assessment tool or a survey tool of some kind, are the form labels properly attached to the element itself? The easiest way to assess that is by clicking on the label. If you do click on the label and the cursor moves to that element, so it selects the radio button or it selects the checkbox, then those are properly associated labels and someone using a screen reader is going to understand what that is asking them to, to complete. If it doesn't, then those are not properly labeled forms, and someone using a screen reader is going to have no idea what that radio button is about or what you're asking them to fill in in a text box. If you're using a product like, let's say, Blackboard Collaborate or other web conferencing software that have audio cues for notifications, things beep at me when people raise their hand or join or leave the room. But are there alternative versions to that? Do I also get a visual notification when those things are happening? Are they provided in multiple formats to ensure that everyone can see them? And does the software that you're choosing to use require any additional plugins or downloads in order to use it? Blackboard Collaborate experience we're using today often requires non-visual users to install something called the Java Access Bridge. And it can be a little complicated and cumbersome if you've never done it before. The new Blackboard Collaborate Ultra system has been designed to not require any additional plugins or downloads in order to successfully use it. And it's that differentiation and that association to the technology that you're using that can make an experience really good or really challenging for someone who relies on assistive technology. So I know that was a lot of information to share. Um, just in general about the framework. We're going to provide you these slides and some links to some information where you can get all of that stuff. But what I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so doing is actually showing you what this looks like in practice and going and looking at a course that I've built that has some good things and some bad things about it and assess my content, my pedagogy, and the technology that I'm using in my class and show you some quick ways that you can do this. We're going to start by taking a look at um, a course in Blackboard Ultra, Blackboard Learn Ultra experience. And then we'll take a look at something that you may be a little bit more familiar with in the original experience. But what I wanted to start off with was assessing my pedagogy. So if we think back to the checklist, one of the most important things was understanding whether there was a syllabus in the class. And there is, thankfully, a very good syllabus available in this class. And it's the first thing that students see when they access the course content. Another was about understanding whether or not there were goals displayed within the content. And to show you this, I'm going to actually dive into my unit one and start looking at some content objects that we have in the course. So if I look at this earth science document, it has some text and it has some information in it. But nowhere in it does it convey what goals this is trying to teach, what objectives this is connected to to help me with my learning. But if I go look at my quiz and get ready to start taking the quiz, there is something that tells me that this, goal, this has been aligned with two goals. And I can click on that, and I can see what those goals are. I can read them. As a teacher, I could potentially align others to it. But what I wanted to show you here was, for me, if I was assessing this course, I'd get partial marks because I did attach goals to some parts of my content, but not to everything to help students truly understand what they're learning and when they're learning it. And now let's take a look at a couple of very specific pieces of content. So the first thing I want to show you is this page of uh, about understanding the water cycle. 
And I realize that this, this image is probably quite small and difficult to read, um, and it is an infographic. There is a lot of information here. It's just an image, but there's a lot of text on it. And it is very, very challenging for someone using a screen reader to use, because this is too complicated to provide simple alternative text for. There's too much information being conveyed here, and it's not just about the text that's here, it's about understanding the cycle and the way that things move, the order of, of the process of the water cycle from evaporation to precipitation to runoff to infiltration to transpiration. Um, and when you go back to the actual layout in my course, all I have here is the image. There's no way for someone who can't consume the image to understand any of this content. What I need to do is provide a narrative or a text-based alternative to this or choose a different way of conveying the water cycle entirely. And if I'm assessing whether or not my course has any ability for my students to work together, there's a couple of things that I would start to drive into. First is do any of these assignments provide the opportunity for them to work in groups? And it's a little unclear right now without creating a new assignment. But I have provided some discussions in the classroom to help the students communicate with each other and work back and forth on specific topics. So again, I might get partial marks here for the types of things that I'm, I'm allowing my students to do and how I'm allowing them to engage with each other. And the last example that I wanted to show you today is this Prezi presentation that I found about um, an introduction to earth science. This while this presentation is loading, um, there's a couple of things that I want, want to call out. So the first is that this looks like a very wonderfully interactive presentation. It's very engaging. It's got a lot of good information. But even in looking at this, the centered text can sometimes be very hard to read, especially for someone with dyslexia, because it's not, um, the lines are not even, and it moves a lot visually when I'm, I'm moving through it. Can create a lot of challenges for reading. But the engagement is very high, so maybe I want to consider, am I still going to use this? And so we want to start by checking, does the whole page magnify? So on my keyboard, I'm zooming in on this page. And so far, this is looking really good. Everything is magnifying, the text, as well as the actions and the buttons within the application. And when it gets to a certain size, rather than overlapping, things collapse into a menu that I can open separately in order to get access to that content. And this continues until you get to a 300% zoom, and then it collapses even the Get Started button down into that menu. So again, I can con continue to consume that content. But you can see that the actual Prezi itself started to become even more challenging to read when you hit a certain zoom target. And if I press Control-0 on my keyboard, it's going to go back to normal. But again, it just gave me a quick opportunity to assess whether magnification software like Zoom text, for example, is going to work for a student who needs the, the larger size screens in order to consume the content. And the last thing I want to check is the keyboard navigation of this tool. And so if I use my keyboard to navigate through this application, there's a couple of things I want to highlight. So first, it shows me where my focus is. Currently, we're on the Prezi logo. And as I tab through this, I'm now on the Create menu. But there's not as good of an affordance for where I am in the application. I don't know if you guys can see it in the Collaborate screen, but the white text that said Create turned to a, a light gray on this navy blue background as I tab through it. And that's the only visual affordance I have to help me understand where my keyboard is. And when I move past Learn and Support, it goes all the way to the far right of the screen to the Get Started button. And all that happens there is it becomes a slightly darker shaded blue. So again, it's really challenging to follow along. And now I'm on login and pricing. And the next place I would expect to go is to that flashing arrow below the presentation so I can interact with the pres presentation itself and move through the content. But I suddenly have no idea where I am. It doesn't go there. And even if I make an assumption about being on the arrow but not able to see it, and I try to interact with that button, nothing is happening. 
So this is, again, an example of how I can see this wonderful, wonderfully engaging content in Prezi that I really want to use in my classroom can't be used if you can't interact with the, with the application using a mouse. A screen reader doesn't get access to those arrow keys to navigate through the presentation, but neither does a keyboard user, which means neither will any other form of input device, whether it's speech to text or keyboard or foot pedals or anything like that. And so as a teacher, I need to make a decision about whether or not I want to continue to use this or whether I need to find an alternative for students who can't interact with anything using a mouse. And the last thing I want to leave you with from a demonstration perspective is looking at how to create, do a couple of things in the Blackboard Learn text editor in the experience that most of you are using, the original experience. So if we go in to build a new item in our course, we can give it a title. Sorry, my typing is not working today. And in the text editor, we can create additional headings by highlighting this text and choosing heading or subheading one or subheading two. It changes the style for me of that content. If we create another subheading, just to show you the difference, it does control and change the styles for me and manage that. But more importantly, it embeds these headings into the overall structure of the page. I'm going to come back in and edit this item in just a quick second, but what I wanted to show you first was how headings work in Blackboard Learn courses. So this heading here, week one people, is actually the top level heading of the page. It's what we call the H1. It's really important that headings follow a semantic structure. So there's a hidden heading level two that you can't visually see, but that screen reader users are made aware of that help them jump to these major sections of the page so that they can move from the course menu to the content section of the page quite easily. And then the title of every content item is a heading level three. And that means that the headings that I created within here need to actually be something below a heading level three for this page as a whole to continue to provide the right structure to a non-visual user. So this Earth Science Introduction title is a heading level three. And my first heading here has been created as a heading level four by default. We do that for you so that you don't have to worry about breaking the semantic structure of the page. One little small caveat with that is that when you copy in from Word, if your Word document has a heading level one or a heading level two, we will still use heading level one and heading level two in that content. So the best practice there, if you were plan on copying content out of Word and into the Blackboard Learn text editor, is to structure your Word document starting at heading level four so that when you copy in here, all the headings are maintained successfully. And the next bit of this is what happens when you add an image into the course. So when I add an image into this course, hopefully this is going to load for me. Let's just quickly find a picture. So when I upload an image into this class, I have this opportunity to create an image description. And I'm just going to change the size of this a little bit so that we can all see what happens. But when I try to save this image or insert this image, the system is actually going to prompt me to say, are you sure you want to, inc to continue without including an image description? So it's reminding me as a teacher that I've just uploaded an image and not provided a textual equivalent. So if I if this makes me think, oh, I need to do that, I can come back in here and write in what the image is. And when you're thinking about how to write alternative text, you don't need to put in things like photograph or image or picture, because the screen reader will actually already know that that's an image. So you really want to be thoughtful and succinct in the information that you're posting in the image description. My general guidance is if you have to use more than 100 characters to write the alternative text, you need to shorten it to something simpler and write an on-screen caption or textual equivalent, because if it's any more than that, it can be really consuming to understand. 
So now when I insert this image into my content object, the alternative text has been added into it. So when a screen reader interacts with this image, they're going to know that that's a photograph of me. So I'm going to switch back now to my slides in Blackboard Collaborate. And just do one quick reminder. There really are three things about all of this. I know it seems like a lot of extra work to start rethinking about everything from an inclusive perspective, but really, truly, the value of this is not in the execution of it, it's in the thinking through it. And I would highly recommend that you all take this and start off the right way with any new content or new course development that you have planned for the upcoming year. You don't need to go backwards and fix everything. You don't need to worry about your historical content, at least not immediately. You really need to focus on your upcoming semesters and your new course content. And if you have the opportunity to, pair up, plan together, share resources and ideas. And Jillian, in a few minutes, is going to give you some information about the Blackboard community where you have access to a, a significant number of educators who can share resources and information. But especially in your own institutions, if there are more than one of you teaching the same course, share that information. Work together to make the content inclusive. And always remember, as educators, you can choose whatever path you like. None of this is about telling you what you can and cannot do in your classroom. This is about helping you understand how to think through it so that you do have a plan and understand how you're going to adjust your content or your pedagogy or the technology you're using in the classroom when a student comes to you and says, I can't access your material or I can't use your Prezi. Do you already have a plan B? Again, we'll provide this link, these links to you, but I've collected together a number of links and resources that may be helpful to you as you move forward in this. Some is about learning how to navigate with your keyboard. A couple are about best practices for accessible content that Blackboard has written and provided and will continue to add to. Others are tools that can help you evaluate the technology. Using tools like Wave and Axe in your browser are going to help you assess the underlying accessibility of the content. They'll help you find things like alternative text that's missing, like links that are not working correctly, like color contrast issues that might exist on the web pages that you're linking to. And then there are several very, very wonderfully valuable art articles that have been written recently by JISC in the UK, all about understanding accessibility and inclusive practices, and especially about how to support learners who are being affected by the DSA funding changes in the UK. These are resources that I've found to be incredibly useful, and I highly encourage you to read them and to follow their accessibility and inclusion blog, because they do continuously post information about how you can make adjustments in your course curriculum. And with that, um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Well, actually, Joanna, what I'm going to do is, because it's four minutes to three, I'm just going to, we'll come back to the questions in a few minutes, because I'm conscious that some people may need to leave, and we've mentioned a couple of things that I'd just like to uh, talk about before we do the questions. So one thing that we spoke about is the community site, which is a relatively new initiative from Blackboard which you can see on screen and we have a dedicated accessibility area there uh, where you can get links to resources, share your stories, ask questions, um, talk about amongst yourselves about what other people are doing and, and Blackboard staff as well. So that's a great resource for you to have a look at and it's where we will put the slides from today and the recording from today which of course you can and share with colleagues. Um, and another new initiative from Blackboard is the Blackboard newsletter, which you can see here on screen on the left hand side. It will uh, it's sent out monthly. It's just gone out today, um, but you can sign up for it and we will send you a link in the email after today to today's and the past six newsletters. Um, but you can see here, you know, the sort of content that it's got, it's case studies from peers, 
updates from the education sector, downloads, um, events like these we always put in the newsletter and it's open for anybody to sign up to. So I uh, just mentioned that and then finally, but I will come back to questions, but I just want to get this in before people have to rush off to three o'clock meetings. We will be sending a short survey out after um, this session and I think Andy, yeah, Andy's put the link in the um, in the chat box which would really value your thoughts and it will really help define what we do in terms of webinars in the uh, new academic year. Um, we really want to gather your thoughts. Has this answered the questions that you've got? Do you want more of it? Do you want other things? Um, are there other topics that you want? So if you could fill in that short survey then it will give Andy and I some work for what we can plan for the later on in the year. Um, as I said, the recordings of the slides will send out by email, but they'll also put on the community site. Um, and there's an email address there if you've got any further questions uh, following this. Uh, if you've got to go, I'll thank you again for attending. Really appreciate the fantastic turnout we've had today. We've been delighted. Um, otherwise, I will go back to the questions. Um, and what we were saying about the questions was that if you can post your questions in the chat for Joanna, then Andy and Ashley will read them out um, on your behalf. Thank you, Julian. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Um, just going right to the very uh, top of the list, Jasper asked a question. Um, how might the flipped classroom take into account inclusive thinking? That's a great question. Um, so with the, the flipped classroom, a lot more of the emphasis on inclusivity goes into the content and the technology choices that you're using because the idea of a flipped classroom is to have the students do a lot of the reading and a lot of the things that you might have previously lectured about um, online prior to coming into class. And then it's thinking about how you can create discussion opportunities and activities in your physical classroom or in your, you, even if it's a, a fully online classroom, in your meeting times that include everyone in the discussion, providing opportunities for breakout sessions in, let's say, Blackboard Collaborate that allow for um, inclusion of other folks. And it's the types of topics that you ask in those classrooms, in my opinion, that, that help with the application of inclusivity in a flipped classroom environment. Ultimately, a lot of the same practices apply. It's just about the order in which you think about them. Excellent. Hopefully that uh, uh, that has um, answered your question. The, 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 there was a question around the version um, of uh, Learn that you were using, uh, Joanna. If, if you're able just to uh, just confirm that. Sure. So the two versions that I showed today, one is our Learn um, SaaS environment with the Ultra experience, and um, so that's only available to our SaaS customers at this point in time. The original experience version that I was using was the April 2016 release, but all of the features that I showed have been around since um, Service Pack 11 in the Blackboard Learn um, original experience session. So everything I showed should be available in whatever version of Learn you are using. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Al at Northampton uh, was inquiring around uh, what screen reading software Blackboard has tested the system with, um, and also if we have any uh, blind staff. My screen's just moved. <laughs> um, so yeah, first question, um, uh, any screen reading software and any blind staff in-house to guide development? So we test with both JAWS, which is the most commonly used screen reader in the market, as well as VoiceOver and a Mac operating system. Those are the two that we use in-house. We contract with a company in the United States called SSB BART Group, and they do a lot of our formal auditing and testing and the issuing of any accessibility support documentation that we provide. Um, they have a number of blind folks on staff who do a lot of our testing. Blackboard does not yet have anyone who is blind on staff, but we do spend a lot of time talking to folks who are um, and would like to continue to do so.
Hello, it's all gone awfully quiet out there. It's David from Edge Hill here. Yes, it has. I'm not really sure what happened there. <laughs> um, I, I, just in the silence, I, I've asked a question in and uh, being cheeky to, to, uh, to uh, but, in, but in terms of content generation and inclusion, which one of the systems would you recommend? We have the learning modules that are built into Blackboard, but we also have things like iSpring and uh, Articulate and other content generation tools. Which one would you have a look at for reasons of accessibility, um, if any at all? And we use a lot of PowerPoint here at Edge Hill. Um, so I, I personally would not prescribe any solution over another until you've done some analysis of, of the accessibility of it, if you're thinking about um, you know, how, how everyone is going to interact with it. If it's a system that generates a particular form of output, HTML or PowerPoint or Word document, then I would be assessing the output of it rather than the authoring side of it, because again, you're looking at the, the primary cons consumers being the, the audience for inclusivity. Um, the Blackboard tools, we work very hard to make sure that they're inclusive, but um, there are a lot of, of reasons and, and very valuable reasons to use external tools and content and pull them into your online courses. Um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in, realistically in the education industry to make sure that all the content and all of the tools that can create content are accessible. Um, I know that probably wasn't a great answer, but really for me it comes down to personal preferences of the content author and then what the output of the tool actually is. Um, PowerPoint actually, that's, is great. Yeah, so I was just going to say that's a fantastic answer because uh, what it says to me is that I need to go and have a look at something, generate the output, and then go and have find some students and test it with. So that, that's really good. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. Um, PowerPoint is, is really good if you um, leave it in a PowerPoint format and don't try to convert it to PDF. And if you are limiting the structure to templates that you've created in the slide master, PowerPoint gets really, really tricky when you are using lots of smart art and diagrams and text boxes all over the place um, because text boxes are read to a screen reader in the order that they are created, not in the order that they are laid out on the screen. So it can be really tricky and challenging to help um, a teacher understand exactly how they need to create content in PowerPoint if they're not just using the standard slide layouts that you create in the slide masters. OK, thank you. Thank uh, you, thank you David. Yeah, I was in the middle of asking Ross's question, which uh, um, I think uh, I'm going to hand back to you, Andy. Are you picking that one up? Or do you want me to yeah, excellent. So um, Ross has asked, have Blackboard considered adding a simple accessibility checker in the content editor or at a course level? We're doing some research into exactly that right now, so if anyone has thoughts about that, I would love to connect with you separately. Okay. What's, the best uh, way to um, connect? What's the best way to do that, Joanna? Is that yeah. through a community site or email? Or yeah, let's really start a conversation the plate, on the community yeah. side about it. Excellent. Let me just uh, quickly scroll uh, around, uh, see if there's any additional questions. Um, okay, David, uh, uh, scrolling down to yours, I think we've taken care of that. Um, and uh, Ross, uh, 1502, we've got yours. Uh, Greg at CS, do you put much worth on instructors completing the title field on images added via the content editor? Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this provides a floating mouse over title text. 1503, that came in. Um, so I put, it, it, de it depends. There's, there's pros and cons to doing it. When you put the title in there, it does create the, the, the little hover tooltip that exists for sighted users. But if you put the title and an image description, both are read to a screen reader um, in, in most browsers. But if you don't put the image description in, none of them are read to a screen reader. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. If you put, you need to put the image description in to make sure that it's properly reading alternative text to a screen reader. But if both exist, many screen readers actually read both. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Joanna. Um, 
Al, if we pick um, that up offline and share some links with you, um, no, uh, that's uh, probably the best way. Uh, Rolf, uh, Rolf Barden, is it possible to change Blackboard as you see it on the screen so that the left column does not follow the right part of the screen? I'm going to make an assumption about the question, and if I get that wrong, we can um, follow up in the community site. I'm assuming that what you're asking for is to make sure that the, the column on the left of the screen is fixed so you can always see it as you are scrolling through content on the right. Um, as of today, no, you cannot do that. Um, but there are, again, very valuable pros and cons to doing something like that that, that we can assess. Um, the ultra experience of Blackboard Learn significantly changes the navigation structures and makes it a little easier to, to do as well. But, um, but there's lots of there's benefits and, and challenges to all of those approaches. Excellent. If um, Joanna has misinterpreted that question, please do drop um, drop your comment in in chat. Uh, Edge Hill University team use Amara to generate captioned videos. One of the benefits is captioning tool works independently of how your video is hosted on the internet, and I think that's more uh, information sharing. Uh, there's a link in there as well. Uh, thank you, Martin. That was at 15:03 for anybody that is uh, interested. Um, Uh, I had some additional sound issues. Hopefully, uh, people are able to uh, pick that up. Uh, there's a lot of good free tools and uh, additional links being dropped in chat uh, that people may want to um, people may want to scan through. Um, and I think. We're getting to the end of the questions there. Um, if we have missed any, please do uh, re-drop them back into chat. Um, I'm keen to make sure that we've we picked everybody up. Um, uh, Andrew, there was a question from Jasper asking if Blackboard can be gamified in inclusive ways. Um, we've never done anything with that yet, but I, I think there, there's interesting opportunities there. And again, I think it's a super valuable conversation for yeah, Blackboard Go. Um, I think it's a super valuable conversation for the community to have. There was a gentleman at BB World, um, his first name is Simon, and I'm, I'm going to butcher his last name if I try to um, say it here, but he's from Grand Valley State University in Michigan, and he presented on um, gamification in his course as a means of inclusion, um, and he's, he's very, very willing to share all of his information. He uses some outside tools to do it that he links to from Blackboard. He's not using the Blackboard-specific tools to do it, but I love the idea of having a conversation around gamification related to inclusion, um, so let's move that to the community site. There's a, there's a question from Kat at Keele University. Um, it would be great for Blackboard to provide static pages around accessibility that can be placed on load or ultra, similar to main websites available. I didn't quite catch all of that, Ashley. Could you repeat it? Yeah. Um, Kat said it would be useful for Blackboard to provide static pages around accessibility. That can be placed on Learn or Ultra. You catch that? Uh, it was it's the the static part that I missed. The static what? Pages. Pages. Web pages. I guess it's your main information. Yeah, I'm un I'm a little unsure about what she means. Whether she means a structured format for creating static page content, or whether she means pages that provide guidance and information about accessibility. Um, if it's the former, then the new Blackboard Ultra document content object um, does an incredibly good job of providing a very, very structured way of creating a single page worth of content that meets all accessibility requirements. Um, so how you add text and images and videos and, and media files and, and combine them all together, we're paying very close attention to that. It's uh, similar to the blank page concept in Learn Original Experience, but it's much more structured. Um, if she meant the latter, it's, uh, we have a lot of information available on our Blackboard help site on an accessibility landing page, uh, but it's not directly connected into the, the course experience yet, but it's all available and, and we can certainly provide and post links to that. Uh, 
Um, thanks. Ashley, can you just confirm? Um, that was Kat's question. Um, Dennis Chambers, University of Salford. Um, not sure if you picked that one up. You can specify the order uh, for your information. You can specify the order of content. It appears on a PowerPoint slide, no matter which order it is added. Yes, um, I did see that. Listen. I'm going to look into it because it's been very challenging to sort out in the past, but, but I'll take a look. And if we can write some instructions for how to do that, we'll post them with the rest of our document creation guidelines. Cool. Great. Um, do you know what? Uh, I, bet, Jasper. I, bet, I was just going to say, I bet Dane has already written some instructions. Um, I'm quite happy to ask him. Um, he's usually very obliged with his then, so I'll, I'll ask if he's got those written already and we can share those. Uh, Jasper asked a question, um, can Blackboard be gamified in inclusive ways? Yeah, we, uh, we've we done that one. That question just a few minutes ago. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, on the call. Yeah, hi, Jane. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I knew you'd say yes. If anybody doesn't know, Jen and I used to work together before I came to Blackboard. So I knew the answer to that question because he's very kind okay, sure. like that. Thanks, Jen. Um, uh, M. M. Herbert, is open education by Blackboard fully accessible? Have we taken care? Yes. So cool. open education um, by Blackboard uses a, a one of our um, normal Blackboard releases and receives all of the same updates. So if you ever find any problems with open education related to accessibility, definitely let us know. Excellent. I think that brings us up to date on, on, on all of those questions. Again, if, if there are any that have been missed, please do re-drop those in in chat. Jill, All right, Jill's repeat? asking, yeah, if we can ask, uh, repeat the location of the help information. Perfect. Done. <laughs> and it is great that help information, really, really good content. Any more questions, please do drop those uh, in chat. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll look to wrap up um, today's session. We're a little bit over time, but it's, uh, it, it's great when we've got that, uh, that interaction uh, with, uh, with you all. If I actually repost something about PowerPoint guidelines for inclusion would be useful. Yes, we will we'll definitely connect with, with some folks who already have some instructions and work together to put something together and link it from the community and from help. Oh, that's really nice feedback. Thank you, Mark and Sarah, Dave. Uh, yeah, David Khan, Edge Hill, thank you. Right, yes, yeah, thank you, everybody. So don't forget, have a look at the community site, the recording and the slides will be there. But Andy's also going to send those out by email as well. Absolutely, we'll... Uh, we'll Go on, yes, this is me. Yeah. We'll get everything um, converted and available, and uh, we will send that shortly.